Hello, Ryan. Jack. I want to talk about pronouns. And no, this is not a, uh, a gender studies class. Well, there's only one ship with uh, non-standard pronouns I can think of. All right. This is the Bismarck episode. So, Ryan, um, back to the uh, discussion of pronouns. Um, I've heard a lot of things over the years. Um, a lot of us always refer to ships as she, mm -hmm. her, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I think it's just easy for us to say that. And then we've also heard that we know that Bismarck is referred to in the masculine, mm -hmm. you know, he, him, um, and whatever the German equivalents of that. are. Yeah, exactly. Um, there are some people who lump all German ships into this, like the Kriegsmarine, it was all masculine pronouns, which is, is, is not true. Mm -hmm. um, Bismarck is the exception. It very much so. And I can't remember who the letter was from about this, but it is very much referring to, we should refer to Bismarck as a he uh, in an exceptional way, which shows that that is not the standard for other German ships. And what's interesting is, so obviously Bismarck, you know, Otto von Bismarck and, you know, Iron Chancellor, um, obviously himself being a male figure, mm -hmm. um, but Tirpitz, he's a German admiral, he's, you know... It, Strong horse and eyes now, I mean, Admiral Graf Spee, Admiral yeah, so, Scheer. Um, but, but not, but still just traditionally referred to, you know, she. Um, and we, we talked about this in a previous episode, but, um, you know, Bismarck and Tirpitz are brother and sister. Uh, Tirpitz, uh, you know, you can refer to as she is the lonely queen of the north. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, so that's how we're going to refer to it. Um, given that it's easy to swap back and forth since we're so used to um, she, her when referring to ships, um, you'll probably hear both Yeah, <laughs> in, no, this, I, uh, in this video. I mess it up all the time and, and I know better. <laughs> when, when I'm thinking about it in my head, when I have time to think about it, I always do it right. When we're just talking and right. covering a lot of ground as we often do, it, it, we slip up. So with that out of the way, with the pronoun discussion, gender <laughs> studies out of the way, <laughs> Bismarck, um, popular in popular cult, you know, pop culture. Um, I sent you Battleship Bismarck by uh, Garski and Doolin. And, uh, the Bismarck Bible, as yep, I call it. There's a link appearing up there, which is you can go back to Ryan's video on uh, the gun comparison mm -hmm. between, the, between the two ships. Um, pretty interesting, actually. The, the comparison between the, the the main battery. I was expecting the Iowa class battleships to have significantly better gunnery performance than than Bismarck. And when you look at the the data for the two guns, they're remarkably similar. Mm -hmm. It made me uncomfortable how similar they were. Even though Bismarck has smaller guns, uh, they have less elevation. Uh, the twin turrets instead of triple. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm, I like the Bismarck class ships. One of the, and the, we did an episode a long time ago about, you know, some battleships, maybe are the Iowa's overrated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people seem to think that Bismarck and Yamato are overhyped um, just because they're Axis and people mm -hmm. like to do that. Um, but then when we discuss the damage that Bismarck takes on its last day in its last battle, and then you talk about the damage Yamato takes on its last battle, you know, and you've done videos about, you know, could New Jersey have survived mm -hmm. these types of engagements? Um, and I think ultimately the answer is probably no. No, no. The, the amount of firepower that eventually sinks Yamato and Bismarck mm -hmm. uh, would have sunk any battleship. Right. Certainly for Yamato. What? How did you refer to battleships in World War II? Like, ham like glass ham what? They're, they're eggshells swinging hammers at each other. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, or glass cannons, yeah. you know, that, that sort of deal. Um, I, now, in, in your in your Bismarck uh, main gun comparison, and especially in, um, 
<laughs> in the Garski and Doolin book, we talk about how Bismarck is built to that larger displacement from the get go. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very much a contemporary. It can be compared directly to an Iowa yeah. because of the, the tonnage of which it's built. It's not it's not just um, it's less North Carolina, less treaty battleship, more contemporary World War II something along we're not we're not comparing it to Yamato of course that's on a whole different level I, I think Bismarck is the closest in terms of capability and displacement to an Iowa class battleship mm -hmm. the Yamatos are significantly larger mm -hmm. uh, and have significantly heavier guns and armor right um, so I am gonna go out and say that so I like to break this into um, going to try to separate this so i'm going to say that bismarck is a better fast battleship in the sort of early stages so like in terms of early model bismarck is a better fast battleship than the u.s fast battleships and then of course in the late war like in the sort of and then in the late designs mm -hmm. obviously the iowas are the best fast battleships like if you were to compare New Jersey versus Tirpitz, I would still say that New Jersey is ultimately the better battleship there. They're a couple of years newer design. But even I would say that Bismarck is a better ship than North Carolina and certainly any of the South Dakotas. And given the gun performance, even compared to the Mark 7 16 inch gun, of course, the previous ships all having the 45 caliber, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the predecessor, um, I would say that. Uh, Bismarck would probably be the better ship there. Now, we have to remember, Bismarck, that whole Bismarck engagement is May of 1941. You know, going through public the public education system, <laughs> World War II starts December 7, 1941, with a bunch of standard class battleships getting nuked in harbor. Because those must be the newest, most modern things we have. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And people tend to forget that not only has World War II been going on since, I mean, you know, you could say the German invasion of Poland, but then some people say, you know, with the Japanese aggression in the Pacific, you know, back in 30s, the earlier thirties. Yeah. yeah. So the whole, so the World War II as a concept is, has been going for, for years. And you could say, well, you know, with the inclusion of the United States, maybe then it truly becomes World War II. Um, I think it's more I think it's already a global conflict even before the United States um, comes in. Um, so we have to remember that the Japanese, you know, expend a tr tr tremendous amount of force to neutralize a bunch of old standard class battleships at Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, you know, North Carolina and Washington, this new generation of ships is being worked up and we're trying to finish the South Dakotas and get them out. Um, but then you hear, here you have this German, this brand new German battleship in 1941, albeit it gets sunk. Um, but I think is, is a far better design and than the U S fast, fast battleships. What do you think about that? On the one hand, it should be at least one quarter better because it's one quarter heavier. The American mm -hmm. fast battleships are designed to be 35,000 tons. Uh, the, the Bismarcks are designed to be 45,000 tons. Mm -hmm. And uh, while with wartime modifications and things like that, the, the American fast battleships will crack 40,000 tons easy. Uh, the, the Bismarcks also go up uh, above 50,000 tons. So there should be 20 or 25% more capability in this larger ship and that, and so it should be the better ship. And I'm not convinced that he is. Why? Give, just give me some reasoning here. The ships, the, the Bismarcks have very little deck armor. That is a common theme amongst German ships, right? And by design, because they're expecting to fight a close range battle in the North Atlantic mm -hmm. or the North Sea, uh, where you've got low visibility and high waves. So you're not going to be able to hit a target anything more than long range. How so you're so it's less about it's it's less about taking 
maybe armor penetrating bomb hits and more about plunging shell fire? Is that what you're is that what you're getting at? Well, both. Bis okay. Bismarck isn't able to do either, uh, and it seems like they don't really account for aircraft being a big deal. Well, not when you know you're being attacked by swordfish, but we all know how that works out. <laughs> yeah. um, and and you have to think the life of a battleship is supposed to be about twenty years. Mm -hmm. So you're not only building a ship that will be good today; that ship will likely still be around in 1960 if mm -hmm. the war goes our way. Mm -hmm. So says the designers of Bismarck. Uh, so so really, you you can't just project. This is good right now, pre-radar, pre-monoplane, mm -hmm. uh, Royal Navy bombers, uh, pre-long-range plunging shots, because Bismarck is completed with radar. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the British or American ships of the same period also have radar. They're, they're primitive sets, even compared to what they'll have mid-war. Mm -hmm. And Bismarck's is certainly primitive compared to what Tirpitz has. But uh, the, the capabilities are already there to extend the range of these projectiles. Mm -hmm. uh, and the capabilities in the aircraft, certainly British Royal Navy aircraft might not be very capable of damaging a ship like Bismarck mm -hmm. uh, unless they fire that golden BB torpedo hit on the propellers yeah, or apparently. on the rudders, which again, any battleship yeah. just about would, would be taken out by that. Um, because even... I think you, you did that too, right? If New yeah. Jersey took a torpedo on a rudder, just because she's got two rudders and this, that, and the other thing, doesn't necessarily mean that she'd be better off in that situation. And I should say that mm -hmm. uh, Garske and Dolan and everybody else involved here make a really fascinating argument based on examination of the wreck that uh, Jim Cameron did, mm -hmm. um, that maybe that torpedo uh, didn't hit the rudder broadside on, maybe it came up straight up the back and exploded between the two rudders, hmm. which I, many battleships have multiple rudders. I can't think of any of them that would have been maneuverable after a hit like that. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because also in, in this book, um, uh, the captain, so as Bismarck is working up, mm -hmm. um, Lindemann uh, recognizes the fact that the rudders potentially are a weakness. I mean, and like, as you've said, maybe any battleship captain should recognize this. Um, so he trains the crew. So the, um, the aftmost secondary battery, the, 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 the six inch, the mm -hmm. 150 mount, that turret, it's, he drills. So that on the port and the starboard side, that crew from that turret, that specifically that that mount is supposed to leave that gun position and go and man the manual controls for each one of the rudders and he times them on that and so bismarck hasn't even left yet mm -hmm. and it's still being worked up and they're already thinking that this could potentially be a problem and i, I just thought that was interesting that he develops this drill for them getting out of this six inch turret running down and getting to the the rudder controls I just, that's, <coughs> to me, that was a bit of foreshadowing that uh, it just, it was almost like it couldn't be real. It was, and that was interesting research I hadn't seen anywhere else before. Yeah. Uh, I am not aware of that being doctrine for U.S. Navy ships. And uh, I never heard of it. I suspect it was not doctrine on all uh, mm -hmm. Kriegsmarine ships. What's interesting, too, is that, and a big difference between, um, Bismarck, a lot of German capital ships and just European ships is this idea that um, you have this mixed secondary battery. Mm. It's really so, it's really like a secondary and tertiary battery when you think about it. Yeah. Um, because the secondary battery is really the, the six inch, the 150s. Um, and then you have the 105s, um, not the, say it. 4.1. 4.1? 5.9s and 4.1. It sounds so dirty. <laughs> so I can't even say it. Um, so obviously um, the captain understood, um, Lindemann understood that in an open engagement, these six inch guns, 
this this mount is not this this turret. It's not really going to be doing a whole lot. I mean, if you're in secondary range, like probably something's not going that well already. So instead of taking, but the true sort of dual purpose mount, the the 105s and any, of course, certainly any of the the 20 millimeter, 37, what what have you, um, is he takes the guy, the crew specifically from that six inch turret, knowing that you're probably not doing a whole lot anyway. So go and fix the rudder versus taking guys off of dual purpose guns that are probably shooting at airplanes or, you know, whatever. So it, it's also an acknowledgement that uh, these guys are the Popeye, the sailors on the battleship. Mm-hmm. They're the yeah. ones who are manually loading these, what are 50, 60 pound projectiles yeah. and powder casings. Into these so they're going to be so like the chads that are down there, like manually wrenching around the rudder. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's see again, that's, that's another point. You know that I, that I hadn't considered. So that's that's pretty interesting about about that. Um, but you have opinions about the uh, four twin turret versus um, three triples. So the U.S. obviously adopts mm-hmm. this. You know, three times three. Um, you know, German and a lot of a lot of German and um, Japanese specifically. You see this too. Obviously, the Yamato class adopts three times three, but the Japanese early on, you know, they were, we'll just put more twin turrets. I especially look at mm-hmm. Fuso, where you have, you know, six twin turrets. Um, the idea being, you know, you can, you divide your main battery out further. So you can, in the Japanese case, you can engage more single targets with your 12 guns versus just, you know, a quarter here, a quarter here, or a third and a third. Which is um, important when you know, when you're expecting, you're writing your doctrine towards fighting a larger Navy, the United mm-hmm. States Navy, or the Royal Navy, mm-hmm. which both the Japanese and the Germans could expect to do. So, so Bismarck divides its main battery of, of eight guns, you know, e- equally, you know, forward and aft. And um, you know, they decide to take on the extra weight of the fourth turret while also losing a gun. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so you, the ship is heavier with less firepower in sort of in the name of keeping more guns online potentially and then being able to maybe engage more targets. I say this because obviously in the Battle of Denmark Strait mm-hmm. where Bismarck um, sinks Hood, Prince of Wales, which is a relatively new ship mm-hmm. and is actually has come out of the dockyard practically right into the Atlantic. It still has dock workers aboard. They're trying to figure stuff out. But um, the King George V class of ships, you know, they were, they were laid down and built sort of right up there before the escalator clause. And so they ended up with their 14 inch guns and they have those quad turrets. So Prince of Wales has an electrical problem and like all the guns go bad. You, You lose one turret, like one, um, one of those quad turrets. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's a huge percentage of your firepower is lost when, especially when you start, when you have four guns in a turret, it's bad enough when it's three. Um, so Prince of Wales is not able to be very effective. I mean, obviously Prince of Wales does get in a few key hits, um, but ultimately could have done, could have done better. Yeah. Yeah. In a knockdown fight with one battleship versus two battleships, Right. Even knocking Hood out very rapidly, Prince of Wales and Bismarck should have been able to trade shot for shot. And uh, Prince of Wales definitely gets the worst of that exchange and withdraws mm-hmm. both brand new ships. Um, in that situation, do you think like if, if you if you swapped Bismarck with North Carolina, let's just say, um, and I'm being generous here, um, would North Carolina be able to shrug off, um, you know, the same British 15 and 14 inch shells? Um, North Carolina also has, unlike South Dakota and uh, the Iowas, North Carolina has that external armor belt, mm-hmm. which I think is preferable over the internal belt. Um, Cause you know, obviously if a shell impacts it, it's less than having a shell penetrate a void space or a tank. Do you think North Carolina favors any better? Uh, you know, uh, especially for the hits on the bow, mm-hmm. that is outside of a, a uh, 
the all or nothing armor scheme. So that shell is going through. Mm -hmm. So it is through hauling your oil tanks and, and it's going to cause uh, you to lose that oil. American doctrine and British doctrine for that matter mm -hmm. uh, is as soon as you're in port to top off immediately in case you have to sortie again. Mm -hmm. That appears to have not been German doctrine. So when Bismarck is last in port, I believe it was in Norway before mm -hmm. she continues through the Denmark Strait, uh, she does not top off her tanks. So losing the, these large forward tanks uh, and already having lower fuel and some of her other tanks and, and steaming around the North Atlantic at near full speed, not at her most economical speed. Mm -hmm. um, forces, so th those whole, I mean, the, 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 the 14 inch shell that penetrates that tank, mm -hmm. well, it does a couple things. It opens up a hole below the waterline, mm -hmm. which has effects on sh the ship just naturally going through the water. Um, and as you said, that oil leaks out. And, you know, even if you can just seal off the other tanks and say, okay, but you've lost now that percentage. Okay. So, and then Bismarck's already low, as you said, for not topping off. And, is, and the American battleships have <coughs> almost 50% more range as built just because they're designed to operate in the Pacific mm -hmm. instead of the North Sea. Um, is, do you think that Bismarck not topping off, you think that is, is just strictly German Navy doctrine? Or is that because like we're in an occupied country and we don't have the resources, even this is still even being 1941, like, you know, we're not capable of doing so where. Uh, even if they don't have the resources, the United States or the Royal Navy, for that matter, and I suspect even the Imperial Japanese Navy would have forward deployed an oiler at mm -hmm. the last friendly stop before this vessel gets underway, mm -hmm. which would have been Norway not all the way back in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, because Bismarck is already low on oil, mm -hmm. fuel, is losing whatever was in that tank from that those tanks, you know, potentially. So then that forces Bismarck to make, to turn and make the course adjustment south um, to head for France. And that's ultimately, that course adjustment is where the British are allowed to pick it back up and then intercept it. And that's where you get the torpedo hit from Arc Royal. And, yep. um, and then obviously Bismarck is sunk. You know, so I mentioned putting North Carolina in the place of Bismarck. However, if Bismarck is, because Bismarck, the crew shores up the hole, like mm -hmm. they, the ship's fine. Okay. They pump out the water, had the fuel not been low mm -hmm. and they could have spared the, the fuel oil lost from the hole, they probably would have kept on that Western track because Prince Eugen stays on and, mm -hmm. and follows the original yeah. course versus Bismarck breaking off and going to, to France. Um, what's actually not known is the um, Roosevelt had put Texas and ultimately Battleship New York out further into the Atlantic <laughs> on neutrality patrols and i'm sorry but the 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 course of bismarck would have intercepted new york which had left rhode island um to to texas was heading back in um and so there's this unknown story that it's like well if bismarck hadn't turned to france well not only could the royal navy potentially not have any of that happen mm -hmm. so bismarck potentially doesn't get sunk in the same way that it does but Bismarck runs headlong into USS New York, which I'm being generous when I'm saying when we're comparing North Carolina to Bismarck, New York and Texas <laughs> are not at all. <laughs> they're, they're the second oldest class of battleships in the U.S. Navy during World War II. They're, um, they're ancient. At this point, I mean, neutrality between the two countries is growing really, really thin. And I think... While Roosevelt is is talking about keeping the U.S. out of the war, there's been multiple incidents now where U.S. ships have engaged with German vessels and are beginning to sort of mix it up in the Atlantic. And it's just a matter of time. Of course, we, as we discussed, Pearl Harbor brings the U.S. into the war. Just um, a couple of months. Just, you know, in December of 41, this is May. But what if Bismarck intercepts New York. And, and Lindemann goes, that's a battleship and it's staring at me. And he goes, you know what? I ain't got time for this. 
and uh, you know, Luchin's then he was like, okay, and then Prince Eugen and and Bismarck open up New York like a sardine can. And that's absolutely the thing. Um, they have already been shot. They they're being hunted actively, mm-hmm. um, and a New York class battleship looks very similar to an, a British R class battleship. So they mm-hmm. probably wouldn't even know that they're looking at an American battleship. Well, especially at the kind of range that Bismarck is capable yeah. of. Like you could look out and say that looks that looks like it's British, and we've already been shot at in this. So and we're we just, know they're hunting. We're us. just going to open fire. And, and you you've know? got one of two scenarios. Mm-hmm. You run into them in the daylight at very long range, and there's the speck mm-hmm. on the horizon that's clearly a battleship that's not yours. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you fire. don't and you don't know what's what's happened either since you sunk Hood. Like for, Churchill could have convinced Roosevelt that. The U.S., you know, yeah. because Bismarck's supposedly under radio silence and you don't really know. Um, so and the other scenario, of course, is you run into that ship pitch black middle of the night. You might have had it as a radar contact first, but mm-hmm. that's just a blip on a screen. And there it's even more likely that you shoot first and ask questions later. Well, right. Um, and so it's really hard to think about, you know, what potentially could have happened. You know, could the U.S. have entered the war a lot sooner with the sinking of USS New York or Texas, you know, out in the Atlantic, even before Pearl Harbor, you know, and then how does that then affect Pearl Harbor? Hmm. If the U S if the U S goes in, you know, declares war on Germany, what, what state of readiness then does Pearl Harbor go, you know, our ships moved out or, you know, are, is hmm. the alert higher or we're not just sitting back, you know, in the hammocks, you know, on December 7th, well, um, you know, do the Japanese take that risk, you know, or do they, or do they think, hey, the U.S. is now engaged eastward. So maybe we don't have to do this because now they're looking the other way versus they're not looking. It's just interesting. And I, I think that Roosevelt for for saying, you know, his, his intentions for keeping the U.S. out of the war, I think that he was very, very being very blatant about sending U.S. ships further and further into the Atlantic, knowing that there are U-boats and German, large German, you know, surface units out there as well. And Germany declares war on the United States as soon as Japan does, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't advantageous for them just because they were allies. I don't think Japan does that. If no. the United States declares war on Germany, I think Japan's just like, we're not with them. No, I think they use that to their advantage. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I think they do still launch the Pacific War, probably with a surprise attack, mm-hmm. uh, when they're good and ready for it. Because part of why they were so successful was that all these colonial powers were already fighting in Europe. Mm-hmm. The Dutch, the British, the French uh, were actively fighting or had already been subjugated. So their colonies were ripe for the picking. Mm-hmm. I think Japan would have loved it if we declare war on Germany, move a couple more of our battleships uh, and carriers into the Atlantic. And then they're able to focus more fire on the few ships that are left and, and get a, more of a free hand in the Pacific. So with that being said, like in a hypothetical situation, if Bismarck sinks uh, New York, um, now you have, and then of course, Tirpitz, um potentially comes mm-hmm. in, you know, mm-hmm. obviously the Royal Navy force is still, is still there. So you have to think like, you know, those ships are just as vulnerable as the, you know, as they prove to be. Um, so what happens? Um, but with two German battleships in the, in the Atlantic and now potentially a declaration of war against Germany, what battleships, you know, like you just said, you know, so now both North Carolinas end up in the Atlantic, like permanently, yeah. you know, or at least until that, Oh that, that, that threat is the, the older American battleships are woefully inadequate compared to Bismarck. They're just too slow to catch her. They're, they're great mm-hmm. on convoy guard duty in the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, not really, because submarines will pick them off. But to protect mm-hmm. against the, these battleships, uh, they're fine. But to go and actively hunt them, all you have is North Carolina and Washington in 1941. But even those ships are suffering from vibration issues at high speed. Like we all take for granted the fact that, you know, New Jersey and, you know, we figured out that, you know, we have the, the four bladed propellers yeah. and the five and, you know, we've worked this out. But by then we have they haven't done that yet. The ships suffer from 
just catastrophic <laughs> vibration <laughs> issues. And they spend, you know, North Carolina spends a bunch of time going up and down, you know, the Hudson River and, you know, other places trying to on these workout and trying to figure this out, what's going on as they're experimenting back and forth with different propeller designs and trying to fix this vibration issue. As, as the know. leadership of her class, she spends a full year between when she's commissioned and when she's actually ready to serve and, and transitioned into the Pacific mm -hmm. to make up some of the losses at Pearl Harbor. So, I mean, even, it, so let's just say North Carolina is thrown into the Atlantic um, because now she has to be. Mm -hmm. Well, much like Prince of Wales. They, yeah. they just sunk one of our big mm -hmm. ships. The public demands a response. We have now sorted everything out of Norfolk. But is North Carolina even capable of dealing with Bismarck at a reduced top speed or given the vibration problems? Because even if even if you just dealt with the vibration, that causes issues in other parts of the ship. Now stuff is being vibrated apart. You got bearings that are having, you know, that have excess mm -hmm. wear. The machinery you put stress on the machinery. Uh, what is your in your experience with as a ship curator? What what do you think about that? The main issue in terms of her combat power was the after range finder mm -hmm. vibrated too much, uh, and especially pre radar, mm -hmm. the the American doctrine was that the forward range finder looks at the target, the after range finder looks at the horizon. Uh, so you can adjust for the role of the ship. Mm -hmm. Now, things like the stable vertical trigger console that has a gyroscope, uh, gyroscope stabilizing it mm -hmm. uh, makes that less important. Um, so it really does just become a backup fire control position. And remember, uh, on American fast battleships, you've got the main and secondary battery, or the, the main, you have two main fire control positions in the superstructure. Mm -hmm. Uh, spot one forward, spot two aft. Then you've got a spot three in, in the top of the conning tower, also forward. Then you've got a range finder in each turret during World War II. And then you can cross connect to your secondary range finder. So you got four more. So you've got uh, fully 10 places that you can aim these guns from. Mm -hmm. And one of them is suffering really severe vibration issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the North Carolina's combat ability mm -hmm. isn't that compromised early in their career. However, they do still have to go out and perform patrol after patrol after patrol on a wartime footing when they can't get into the yard as much as they need. And uh, there's no telling when they're actually going to encounter one of these ships. So uh, like you were saying, th there is a much larger maintenance cost the North Atlantic is an unforgiving environment for mm -hmm. ships and your ability to go back into port and get repaired is, is really limited. So uh, it would likely not be a fully combat effective ship that does. We also have talked in the past about uh, Washington mm -hmm. and its engagement with Karishima and how Admiral Lee was able to look at the Navy's provided gunnery charts <laughs> and his, he would say, well, that's wrong. And he through crew training, devised a new set of charts with, under the best of circumstances, if North Carolina had to engage Bismarck, knowing what we know about the chart inaccuracies that Admiral Lee uncovers later on, do you think that North Carolina's gunnery, even if the range, even though there's no vibration, keeping everything mm -hmm. perfect, do you think that North Carolina's gunnery would even have been as good? Because as we know, Bismarck is able to put, start putting shells pretty much on hood in just a few salvos. Um, their gunnery was excellent during the Battle of, Battle of Denmark Strait. That is correct. And that's at a range of uh, roughly 11 miles mm -hmm. and then decreasing because hood is trying to close range. Mm -hmm. um, which the, the ship that scores the first hit has the advantage in this, in this battle. They're, they're very similar. Uh, in terms of capability. So the ship that scores the first hit has the advantage. Um, in theory, American fire control can hit a battleship sized target at much longer range. And of course, the guns have ranges in excess of uh, 40,000 yards, more than 20 miles mm -hmm. away. And uh, Bismarck scores this hit at 11 miles or less. So in theory, the American ship and Bismarck, for that matter, can start shooting much further away if the weather allows it or the radar picture allows it. Uh, 
so it, it does come down to you're, you're not really using your range tables at that point. You put your first shot mm -hmm. on the target, and you see that you're off by 600 yards short or whatever. You, you start to adjust up from there. Uh, can the Americans adjust quickly enough? Uh, I guess know, my thought is we know the Germans were very you know proficient B in their guns. Bismarck had already engaged Hood, like the, the, the yeah. like they were already sort of in this worked up, you know, and they were obviously very sort of comfortable with their ship, you know. And then again, you have this very new North Carolina, which hasn't maybe just immediately thrown into action against Bismarck. I, again, I if I had to say, I'd probably say, well, Bismarck would probably strike first. And again, there's so many variables. We've had this conversation multiple times and, you know, there's no right answer. Um, but this is this is ultimately what leads me to my to my my thought of in May of 1941 um, and certainly into the summer months. You know, obviously in, in real life, you know, Bismarck gets, you know, um, torpedoed in the rudder and then gets sunk in by shell fire and torpedoes and a little bit of crew scuttling mixed in there, uh, depending on who you talk to. Huh. Um, and that's it. That's the end of the mm -hmm. story. Um, but, you know, with Bismarck and Tirpitz sailing around, you know, in June or July or August, you know, what what happens? Does, is North Carolina a real adversary to this German battleship, which is now, you know, has a battleship, you know, a little kill, <laughs> a little kill board with, you know, another battleship on it, which, you know, again, as we discussed, few battleships in World War II be, are able to to say, you know, engaged in and yeah. sunk uh, uh, an opposing battleship. So um, so that, that's why I, I maintain this idea that I think Bismarck is sort of in, in the early war sort of the best fast battleship. Hmm. Um, I don't, and again, I'm, I'm saying North Carolina and I'm not including the South Dakotas because I think the South Dakotas suffer from a little bit more treaty era design weirdness that I think even makes them a little worse than North Carolina. I, I like to think that the external armor belt of, of North Carolina is better than the internal belt. Um, I'm not entirely sure I agree with that, but I see where you're coming from. Yeah, uh, I, I would say that the, the crew training um, and again, I'm biased against Bismarck. The mm -hmm. Bismarck's crew was very well trained up in the Baltic, and they had this protected water to do this training in. Mm -hmm. um, but the German Navy was new at operating battleships again. They they hadn't. They, they were very rapidly expanding after the Anglo-German naval agreement, uh, so they didn't have this huge pool of experienced folks around. And the American Navy, and the British Navy for that matter, did because they had been operating battleships all along. So even though mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina was relatively new, uh, that crew, the crew of that ship had grown up serving on other American battleships. That's fair. That's, that's a fair point. Uh, and, and we see Prince of Wales' crew, mm -hmm. uh, that's a brand new ship, but they grew up serving on other battleships. And then they are able to hold Bismarck mm -hmm. during that battle. Mm hmm you know, again, more sort of lucky hits that, that the whole engagement between the lucky hit on hood, mm -hmm. the lucky 14 inch hit, <laughs> which causes, which ultimately means Bismarck has to turn around the torpedo. Like it's that whole engagement is this one in a million scenario that is just so fascinating to think about that. That's actually how that turned out. <laughs> and then as we discussed, there's, you know, what was the alternative? Like had, the one in a million shot not happened three, four, five times, you know, what, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> um, what, what potentially would have been, you know, the outcome. Um, and then of course, you know, them saying that by the time the Iowa's hit the water and are certainly by commit, you know, by the time they're commissioned, mm -hmm. those ships have far surpassed the Bismarck class. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, if New Jersey sailed out into the Atlantic, you know, Tirpitz was sailing out there. I, I would, I would be, I'd, turn that thing back around and head towards Norway as fast as possible. <laughs> and as New Jersey, like stalks that and stalks turpits and chases her down, you know, that would be interesting. Um, and then, you know, who knows then what, what happens, you know, as we discussed with plunging shell fire and other thing, you know, what would uh, an engagement between an Iowa class battleship and a, and turpits ultimately look like, you know, how much shell fire could, because I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, when Bismarck is in his final battle taking all these shells, mm -hmm. I think it's a 16 inch shell from um, Rodney, which I think hits 
either the conning the armored conning tower and bounces into turret two or something uh, 16 inch shell from rodney hits turret two ultimately and hits it with enough force to where the shell just kind of bounces off itself but it knocks it off its rollers mm -hmm. and then you know so slowly bismarck starts to lose turrets um and you know so it's even if that shell doesn't necessarily penetrate or you know you're still doing heavy damage to the ship systems and everything else um and of course you know rodney being a 16 inch equipped british yeah. battleship you know versus the 14 and 15 you know that we're so used to but the American 16-inch shell is almost 600 pounds heavier than their British equivalent. Well, right. So, so that's kind of my point. Yeah. It's like, so when you introduce, you know, a Mark VI gun or a Mark VII, especially later yeah. on, you know, what kind of greater damage could that inflict if, a you know, a shell from Rodney is able to knock Bismarck's, one of Bismarck's turrets off of its roller, <laughs> then what's, you know... A deflected shot, yeah. yeah. Um, at, at, at close range, mm -hmm. Bismarck's armor can stand up to even the super heavy American 16 inch shell fire. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not going to uh, sink her, or it's not going to penetrate her citadel. At long range, the American armor can reject the 15 inch shell, and the German deck armor is not rejecting mm -hmm. the American shells. Uh, but at close range, there, there's a lot of advantages with the secondary and tertiary batteries of the German ships, with the uh, turtle back armor scheme mm -hmm. uh, and, so, yeah, and their so fire control systems as well. Let's talk about that for a second. So the turtle back inside of a German ship, that citadel roof mm -hmm. um, looks like the shell of a turtle. Mm -hmm. And so shell fire coming in kind of, there's an angled plate that kind of can deflect shells away from punching through. Exactly. You have to defeat Bismarck's armored belt, which is pretty similar to a North Carolina or an Iowa for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, defeat that belt. And then on the inside of that belt is an angled uh, part of the armored deck that you also have to defeat. But now your shell has lost a lot of its energy. Well, especially if, if you've penetrated through the main arm yeah. the belt, that most of your shell's energy has gone into that. So just a little bit of turtle back and angling of that internal plate and your shell's probably tumbling, mm -hmm. and now it's hitting something that's angled, so it's not hitting it straight on. It's most likely going to deflect and upward. It's probably been your shell's been decapped, and yeah. like you said, tumbling, and so it's it it just needs just a little bit of extra bit to just deflect it off. Yeah. So so the ship's citadel is perfectly <coughs> intact. She's not going to be in danger of sinking. Now mm -hmm. uh, things like turrets, the range finders, command and control spaces, communications. Uh, and I think this is what comes, this is where the great debate is, you know, is Bismarck scuttled um, versus obviously the, the British do launch torpedoes. Um, those torpedoes hit, you know, James Cameron in the, the rec now analysis, you know, looks at it and he says, yeah, you, you do see the torpedo damage. But he also said, you know, for a ship that sank, you know, I would expect to see more hull, like more damage on the hull mm -hmm. from the actual sinking as the ship plunges towards the bottom he goes i don't see that and he goes that means some of these spaces were pre-filled with water and he goes that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense so that's it kind of reinforces this scuttling where it's mm -hmm. like the ship is the ship is 100 percent doomed the, the royal navy is not leaving that scene <laughs> there, there's no mythical thing where the royal navy just leaves and then bismarck gets towed by something you know <laughs> back to france yeah, the royal navy decides um, we're all out of gas we gotta go so so that so the royal navy sinks bismarck that's that's not what we're talking about here it's you know it's a combination of this ship is seriously damaged nothing works it's already listing you know things on fire it's like well okay let's just call it a day here <laughs> open up some valves and everyone jump overboard yeah um so yeah we're not we're not really having that conversation <laughs> not if you know no one's hopefully no one's offended <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the, the, the royal navy did the exact wrong thing they had limited ammunition and fuel so they closed the range as much as possible mm -hmm. but that was where bismarck was most protected if they had have been able to land hits mm -hmm. from further away they would have been able to defeat the citadel mm -hmm. uh, which they could not do at close range mm -hmm. but they did certainly still destroy that vessel and eliminate its combat well, i mean potential. yeah i mean no yeah no matter how armored the citadel is the ship becomes you mission killed it when you've peeled away the superstructure yeah. and turned it into Swiss cheese. And if you know, if, if you, the wreck photos, I think are, are fascinating because you look at Bismarck on the bottom 
And yes, there's still some damage evidence and you see shell holes in the superstructure. But so much of that superstructure actually was peeled off as the ship goes to the bottom. And my only thought is it's like this thing was so shot up and so <laughs> full of holes that that material was so loose <laughs> and just so ruined that it just allowed it all to kind of just be washed off by the the ship going to the bottom and so then you end up with this ship on the bottom that's like that doesn't look nearly as bad as the smoking wreck that you see in yeah. photos you know as the ship is, is sinking and you know that's where you get the whole hey you know you can almost raise that thing and you know you'd be good to go um <laughs> that so. was another interesting thing about the wreck analysis mm -hmm. in this book uh talking about how uh dr ballard when he finds it mm -hmm using a submersible that, that's got a downward looking camera, it's looking mm -hmm. at the top of this thing, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. she's super intact. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, uh, Mr. Cameron goes down mm -hmm. and looks at it uh, and actually is able to get up on the side of the ship, you can see that she is crushed a little bit as she hits the seafloor and it's mm -hmm. nowhere near as intact as it originally looked just because the technology is so much better. Mm -hmm. uh, but even so, a ship that's been shot to pieces like that over the course of a week, getting in multiple engagements mm -hmm. with enemy battleships and then burned and then flooded and then dropped two miles onto it, a seafloor. Into the side of a underwater mountain. And then slides. And, then, and then slides a further bit down. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, stops in a cloud of dust. Um, but I think that speaks to the actual structural integrity of that ship. Yeah. The fact that it was so incredibly armored, it was mm -hmm. all welded. It was so well put together that it not only survives being shot to hell and then survives the plunge <laughs> in, into the side of the underwater mountain. Which certainly um, is not something her designers were like, we need to make her mm -hmm. be able to survive this, but it, yeah, <laughs> super compelling. I completely understand why people are in love with this ship. Mm -hmm. She looks aggressive and she took a tremendous beating. But at the end of the day, I have issues with the, the basic uh, premises of the design. We should design her to be able to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that fit into your doctrine? Well, how is that a good design dictators choice. don't have doctrine dictators are like I, I need this to look pretty which is why german ships look fantastic yeah, that's why japanese ships look fantastic it's why italian ships look fantastic uh, yeah i think you know me well enough that i don't really british think, ships do not look fantastic. i don't think that you, except for the iowas i don't really think u.s ships look that good <laughs> especially the smaller ones you know the like, iowas and the alaskas okay the, uh, well yeah so the, the iowas and the alaskas fantastic looking the USN, U.S. Navy ships vary function over form. And you know what? That's how you win wars. Yeah, that's why. You, know, you can crank them out, you know, about 100 at a time yeah. and then just call it a day. North Carolina you know? at 35,000 tons has yeah. equal combat potential or possibly greater. We, we can yeah. still debate this to Bismarck at mm -hmm. 45,000 tons and 20 mm percent -hmm. bigger. Yeah. And again, a lot of that's armor. This armor, you know, 40 percent of her total weight is armor. And it's incredible. No other ship achieves that that mm -hmm. weight. And yet that armor is all focused at a close range engagement. Her, her mm -hmm. guns are less armored than an American ship. Her fire control positions are less armored than an American ship. Mm -hmm. Her decks are less armored than, than an American ship. It's just all belt and turtle back. Essentially. She essentially has two belts, the, the mm -hmm. actual belt and then the, the turtle back part of the deck mm -hmm. there. And that renders that part of the ship impenetrable. But the rest of her is still terribly vulnerable. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna call it there because we could keep going. <laughs> but uh, but please let us know what you think. Uh, Bismarck overrated, underrated. Do you think uh, in 1941 is uh, the uh, U.S. Navy really capable of winning a, an engagement against Bismarck? And uh, if so, wh what do you think? You know, do you think uh, the U.S. declares war on Germany if Bismarck sinks Texas or New York? Uh, leave a comment down below. And uh, as always, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. See, See you again. next time. <laughs>